Okay, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Gene Fidel, my brother Gene Fidel, and this is Life in the Law. And P.S. Gene is a lawyer who has been involved in military justice for most of his professional career, may I say. Welcome to our show, Gene. Thanks, Jay. It's great to be back. Yeah. Um, and you have been on here before. We talked about Guantanamo. I hope you remember. It was a I few do. years ago I do. Yeah, when you were here last. So um, let's talk about military course, justice. Before we get to military justice, let me say about Guantanamo. It's interesting. We're still at it. We still have people uh, who are being detained at Guantanamo. We still have military commissions that drag on and on and on. It's like watching taffy, taffy dropping. Uh, and in a way, it's extreme. It's a different subject, I understand. But in a way, it's extremely unfair because nobody is getting closure at Guantanamo. I mean, imagine if you lost a loved one on 9-11. And it, here, it's 2019 it's already. 18 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's really, that's a different show, but I, I, I think it's important to flag that as kind of a first cousin to what we're really here to talk it, about. It really is, yeah. It's not, not good commentary. Um, anyway, okay, military justice. Can you give me a, you know, you are the leading expert in the country, in my humble opinion, in, in military justice, and you've been that for a long time, since what, roughly 1980 or so, if not sooner. And so that makes almost, what, 30 years, actually. Can I get there? 30? Oh. 40. 40. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a show in mathematics. 40, almost 40 years. So can you talk about why you got into that and what you've done in that in general? Well, I got into the field of military justice uh, basically because, like many people of my generation, I had to go into the service one way or another. Uh, it was my opportunity to go into the U.S. Coast Guard after law school. And uh, any time you became a military lawyer, whichever branch you happened to be in, you had to learn how to prosecute and defend a court-martial. And so that was sort of the uh, building blocks, and I found that after I left active duty, after three years, seven months, and eight days, that... Uh, <laughs> but who's counting? But who's counting? <laughs> uh, that it was an area that I, I thought I could... I had an intuition that I could make a contribution, and uh, oddly enough, and greatly to my surprise, I've maintained an involvement in it uh, ever since. So it's... Um, I'm, I'm as surprised as the next person that uh, after all these years I'm still engaged by it and I find it interesting, as important as ever, and uh, uh, engaging in, in many ways. Well, now you've, you've done a lot of cases. You've been counsel in military justice litigation many, many, many times over. You've handled, I, I would venture to say, thousands of cases, some very high profile cases, cases in which you succeeded, uh, incredibly so sometimes. Um, but you've also been active in developing the area of military justice, both nationally and globally. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, the, the funny thing about military justice is uh, most lawyers don't know anything about it. They have no occasion to know anything about it. The organized bar takes very little interest in it, uh, even less so than uh, in the uh, last several decades. Uh, it's a specialized uh, field and one that is largely overlooked except when something goes south. Mm. And, uh, and then people uh, will start to pay attention and occasionally Congress gets in, into the act, uh, occasionally the federal courts get into the act. But by and large, it remains a rather secluded part of the forest. Mm -hmm. You've been, you've been up to the uh, appellate courts on military justice issues. You've been at conferences all over the world uh, in, the, in the global discussion around military justice. You've had an effect, uh, and you've been able to observe how things have been going, how the area has been evolving, not only here, but elsewhere. And, you know, it, it strikes me that, you know, back in the time when you were in the service, that was, a, that was not a volunteer service. That was a service under the shadow of the draft. Correct. Uh, and, that, and that's a different world, and it, it is to me anyway. But later, in the, in the course of the development of your career, it became, a, it was, it had become a voluntary service. How does that change the, you know, the consciousness, the awareness that you spoke about 
uh, the concern, the involvement um, of, about military justice? Yeah. I, I think it changes in two ways. Number one, uh, you didn't have, you don't have in the all volunteer force era that we're currently in, uh, and have been in since the mid 70s, you don't have the constant influx of uh, lawyers who everyone knows are going to be coming in and leaving. Uh, instead, people tend to come in, maybe it's only a matter of degree, but they tend to come in with more of a, at least, potential expectation of remaining for a career. And there, there may be consequences to that. If a person knew that he or she was coming into the JAG Corps uh, and would be leaving uh, almost inevitably, uh, is that person maybe a little more willing to break China in the courtroom? Uh, a little less concerned about promotion. Uh, that's, that's at least a, a question. The, the other thing, of course, is that I think since the 70s, uh, the federal courts, <clears throat> two things have happened involving the federal courts, and maybe they're related. The first is the federal bench has drifted to the right uh, in general. In the, including the Supreme Court, but also the intermediate it's courts. It's been going on for courts. a long time. It's now. been going on for a long time. Uh, and maybe as a result of that, there is much less willingness on the part of federal judges, uh, life tenured, you know, Article Three federal judges, to get concerned, get involved in the uh, nitty gritty of the administration of military justice. So uh, are, are, th are those two or three things connected? Probably they are on some subliminal level, but mm -hmm. I think that they're all noteworthy. Now let me ask you about a third possibility that comes to my mind. Anyway. And, and uh, just before, you mentioned before about the global dimension. Yes. One of the other things that's changed is because of the internet, it's now possible to uh, get a fairly good current sense of uh, military justice issues in other countries which was very difficult to do uh, before the digital era. Today, you can go online, you can look at blogs. I run a blog called Global Military Justice Reform. Write that um, down. <laughs> Write that down. Global Military Justice Reform. Blogspot.com. Google that and you'll get there. But, but okay. the, the point It'll is... It'll be on the final exam. Okay. The, the point is that you could go there or other websites and come away with just a few keystrokes with a sense of what kind of issues are emerging in other countries' military justice systems. And it's, it's fascinating to me, it's been enriching professionally to realize that the kinds of issues we have had to address often resonate, they may rhyme with issues that come up in other uh, countries, particularly the countries that share the Anglo-American legal tradition mm. uh, that we have. Like stare decisis. Like stare decisis, but uh, just the, the basic arrangements between command and uh, the administration of justice. So our decisions that are made elsewhere are you know, rules, statutes, what have you, directives published elsewhere in the world. Are they relevant? Could they be cited? Do you cite them? in uh, litigating military justice issues here in the United States? I have in the past, but unfortunately experience teaches that judges uh, really don't care very much about what happens in other countries. I personally think that uh, our judges should at least be aware of what's going on in other countries, and judges in other countries ought to be aware of what's going on here. I think that the dialogue between legal systems and among legal systems is fruitful, it maybe makes us more perceptive about issues, maybe not the outcome, and they're not entitled to uh, value as precedent, mm. but they're f food for thought at the very least. What about the gift of knowing how it works here and then traveling to far off places, including developing countries, and showing them how it works here and maybe uh, exposing them to arrangements that might help them develop their own system? We certainly do that. Uh, we, we have uh, programs. There's a program uh, run out of uh, Newport, Rhode Island uh, that uh, carries the f shows the flag, basically, and uh, assists third and fourth world countries in 
uh, bringing their military justice systems uh, up to contemporary standards, or at least beginning to approach contemporary world standards. And we're talking about human rights standards, by the way, when in this mm. part of the forest. Um, but I think there can also be a kind of arrogance uh, in that effort to export U.S. values. I mean, I don't think the world of military justice uh, begins and ends with the Uniform Code of Military Justice, our basic statute. I don't think the world begins and ends with the Manual for Courts Martial. Uh, other countries are entitled on a certain level and to a considerable extent to go their own way. The challenge is to try to figure out if there are neutral principles sounding in human rights that really countries should struggle to honor. And I, I think that is probably the theme, if you were talking about from 2019, what happens next, mm -hmm. I think that's the, the theme that people should have in mind as they uh, monitor developments in other countries. And it's going to be, it's going to be very tricky and it's going to be complicated. And it, it, you know, what China does in the area of military justice is going to be quite different from what, let's say, India does. Uh, and so on across the country, uh, the, the world, as you look at different legal systems, different legal traditions. Well, human rights and also, you know, the rights that are afforded in, in the civilian courts. Uh, I know you've been on that issue from the beginning of your, your time in, uh, in this, in this, uh, pr this study. Um, namely, you know, the, the Uniform Code, the Manual for Courts Martial, it's pretty tough sometimes. It's built, uh, it was built for battlefield use. Um, and then you have the civilian courts, which have mm, greater procedural rights, maybe substantive rights afforded to the accused. And I know you have made that comparison, and you have tried to bring the, the rights that are available in the civil courts uh, into the military. How successful have you been? What kind of evolution have we seen in the course of your 40-year career uh, to bring those rights into the military? Um. Well, it's not my effort. Uh, the, you know, this is uh, the, flow of, it, the flow of legal history that I've been uh, privileged to participate in, observe, and so forth, and, and chronicle on a certain level. Uh, clearly, there's been a, a, a move towards civilianization, uh, which uh, a word that uh, at times has seemed to be a dirty word uh, in the world of military justice. That's not a good thing. Uh, but I think there's a growing recognition that basically the closer we can get to the, uh, the uh, classical model of American criminal justice in the uniform setting, the uniform services setting, the better as a matter of principle. That's not to say there aren't going to be departures. The Constitution itself recognizes uh, some differences. The question is, how sh should those differences be expanded? Should, be, should they be strictly construed? Uh, how do you uh, reconcile the competing trends? And, and of course, as you, your question points out, you're dealing with a moving target because it's not exactly uh, as if American criminal justice in general has remained uh, at a standstill. It's, it's moved. It's moved uh, at times uh, in what say, let's say, a progressive way, um, but at times there can be retrograde developments as the Supreme Court and other federal courts have drifted to the right. Uh, at times lurched to the right. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, do we see that happening in the area of military justice? I certainly can think of one illustration where uh, during the Warren Court era, we had a decision that restricted court martial jurisdiction to offenses that were service connected. The off-base rape, for example, could not be prosecuted in a, uh, a military court, a court martial. And after about 18 years or so, the Supreme Court had changes of membership, and they revisited the question, and they overturned their own precedent. And so now, uh, for better or worse, worse in my judgment, but for better or worse, uh, uh, any offense committed by a, uh, a member of the armed services is punishable by uh, court-martial, even though it has no connection, no other connection to the military uh, service. Yeah, there's very interesting digression on that is... Um situations where civilians who are not necessarily subject to, to uniform code of military justice by its terms wind up being tried by courts martial going back to um, you know the conspiracy against Lincoln well that that's exactly right and there there are two dimensions uh, here the the first is uh, and, and this is mostly a foreign human rights story uh, there are countries thank goodness ours is not one of them 
basically. I, there's, there's some footnotes, but I don't want to get into the inside, inside baseball on this. But basically, we don't try civilians by military courts. There are other countries that do, and they do it regularly, and it's uh, really appalling. It's a, a blatant violation of contemporary human rights standards. Uh, I'm talking about countries like Egypt. I'm talking about Cameroon. I'm talking about Uganda. I'm talking about Pakistan. These countries are repeat offenders. They are completely indifferent to the uh, evolved contemporary standards for human rights. Now, the other a uh, piece of that is, who is a civilian? So a current issue is, what about retired military personnel? Now, Congress has provided that certain categories of retired military personnel remain subject to a trial by court-martial. Uh, that is, uh, I've been involved in some litigation. I'm involved in some litigation on that right now. I don't want to go into, you know, arguing it, but it is a fact that that is one of the battle lines that uh, we're going to have to work through. That's an issue that the U.S. Supreme Court has never squarely addressed, even after all these decades of American independence. Uh, so that's, that's really going to be a fascinating one. Another sidebar issue here is command influence. Command influence, uh, we see this happening today, even though it, it should be settled law that nobody should be trying to uh, affect uh, the judgments of a court-martial or a court-martial judge. Um, but it's still an issue that's very, very much alive. Uh, what's the state of the law on this? What's the state of the practice? What's the state of the violation of the law and the practice? Right. So. Uh, Un uh, unlawful command influence is the concept. There's a lot of command influence that's perfectly lawful under U.S. law, but there, uh, as a matter of uh, both statute and the judicial gloss on the Uniform Code of Military Justice, we have a doctrine of unlawful command influence. This is essentially a distortion of the judicial process in ways that either are specifically unfair to an accused or call into question public confidence in the administration of justice. There's two different uh, concepts working. Uh, the first of these is called actual unlawful command influence. The second is apparent unlawful command influence. Together, the common phrase is that unlawful command influence is the mortal enemy of military justice. It's an article of faith. It's probably the core principle that animates the administration of military justice today in our country. Uh, you cannot have a conversation about uh, unlawful command influence uh, without talking about two things. Number one, uh, how does this relate to Congress? Because members of the Senate and House seem to be much freer with their advice and opinions about things uh, concerning specific military cases than they would ever dare to be about uh, cases pending in the federal district courts. And more than they were in the past. And more than they were in the past. Uh, the, the, uh, this is something that Congress is going to have to fix uh, as a matter of their internal ethic. And uh, I think this is a challenge. I don't know really how that's going to unfold, but I would like to think that uh, somebody will take a firm stand and tell members of the House and Senate, look, keep your hands off the administration of justice in specific cases. So that's one dimension. Mm. The, other, the other aspect is, getting back to the military justice system, it is a fact that cases of unlawful command influence, both actual and apparent, arise with amazing regularity. And I don't want to talk about specific cases. Uh, uh, you know, they're everywhere. Uh, it's, they're not all equally valid. Not all claims of unlawful command influence are equally valid. Uh, some of them, it's easy to make the claim, uh, but it's not so easy sometimes to carry it over the, the goal line. Uh, why do they come up so often? And that brings, brings the conversation around to what I think is the core uh, structural issue that Congress is attempting to get its hands around uh, and it's an issue that we have George III uh, to thank oh, for. Oh, George III. Can we zoom back and see a picture of George III? There he is. That's George. He <laughs> joins us. And, and let me say, George, if you want to say anything, this is your big opportunity. Okay. We're, we're waiting. <laughs> but here's the, here's the problem. 
The problem is that the military justice system that the colonies inherited from the UK uh, is still uh, with us today. The core proposition is that the role of the commander uh, remains central to the administration of justice. And we still have that today, even though Congress passed uh, uh, ex uh, exceptionally uh, broad, uh, comprehensive changes only recently uh, in the Military Justice Act of 2016 that just went into effect, the heart of it, Congress left uh, uh, unaffected. And the heart is that the commander is responsible for deciding who gets prosecuted, for what offenses, at what level of severity. The commander also has certain other responsibilities that Congress left unaffected, such as picking the members of the military jury. Or and, the, and reviewing the result, no? Well, that's been, that's been dialed back uh, okay. over time. But, the, but negotiating pretrial agreements, for example, remains a command function. Mm. So where this is manifesting itself right now is in the ongoing conversation, uh, mostly in the Senate, about the bill introduced by Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York called the Military Justice Improvement Act that would basically take away from the commander, who is ordinarily a non-lawyer, almost invariably a non-lawyer, the power to make charging decisions and give it to a legally trained attorney, a judge advocate, uh, outside the chain of command, so that you would not have uh, a merging of functions. You'd not have uh, the risk of conflicts of interest, for example, where the charging decision was made by somebody who might have an interest in saying, this accused is a terrifically lethal fighter pilot. I'm not going to send this case to a general court martial. Mm. Uh, or uh, allowing other considerations to come into play other than what are the demands of a criminal justice system. Mm. So that's, that's the sort of looming issue right now, and uh, maybe viewers have seen the recent hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee where Senator McSally, uh, a, a former fighter pilot herself, uh, talked about her own sexual assault. Uh, Senator Gillibrand was very vocal about this. I think uh, um, uh, one of the Hawaii senators was present at this hearing. Uh, uh, this is an issue that uh, senators have to grasp the nettle on and decide, are we going to continue with basically an 18th century system, or are we, like other countries, ironically included Great Britain, including Great Britain, have abandoned in favor of having prosecution decisions made by trained lawyers outside the chain of command? So that's the, the, that's the biggest single institutional issue we're dealing with. Military lawyers. The, the, yes. the, special, the special prosecuting person is a military lawyer. Uh, yes. I, Under the code himself uh, uh, or herself. Yes, right, right. Now, uh, let me say, if you were working on a clean slate uh, and were really willing to think outside the shower here, you could well say that prosecution decisions should be made by, let's say, uh, somebody in the criminal division of the Justice Department. Mm. You might have, for example, a chief military prosecutor in the criminal division at the deputy assistant attorney general level. That would be a very different system. There are countries that have civilianized the prosecution function. Uh, other countries have not done that. So to be clear then, um, this would not affect uh, Article 15 masks, non-judicial punishment. It would only affect court martials. Well, the, the, there is an issue where you would draw the line. Yeah, so the minor disciplinary matters should, uh, in my opinion, and I think most people, even people who support the reform, uh, would agree, uh, should remain within the uh, the bailiwick of of commanders. Uh, it, the question is where you draw that line, and one year is the line that the manual for courts martial actually the, the draws in defining one year's punishment, uh, confinement, is the line that courts martial ordinarily draw between minor disciplinary matters and matters that are more like criminal offenses. Now, what you, but your question, Jay, raises a very interesting issue, and it's the next big thing that has to be studied. There are uh, some hundreds of courts martial every year. There are tens of thousands of minor 
disciplinary proceedings called non-judicial punishment, Article 15, office hours in the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. uh, captain's mast in the Navy and mm -hmm. Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of the low level, low visibility administration of justice that actually uh, is much less well known, but has much more uh, impact where the rubber meets the road, out in the fleet, out in the field, uh, in the administration of justice, as it affects most GIs. And what, what uh, is I think beginning to take shape now, and I, I hope to be able to play a role in this, is a serious national and international conversation about how summary discipline should be administered. Are there some neutral principles that apply? Uh, is it possible to reach common ground? Uh, who should be prosecuted for what by these, these administrative non-judicial uh, sanctions? Uh, it's very interesting. It's very understudied, under-theorized. Uh, these cases occasionally get into the federal courts, but it's unusual. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the next, the, the next big thing. But the baseline there is that the commander on the scene, on the ship, in the battlefield, has to have the ability to um, mete out summary punishment in order to maintain good order and discipline. Right. If, he, if he has to wait on a bureaucratic process that must wait on other personnel, other legal personnel, uh, when he gets back to port or back to a larger command, he, he will not be able to meet it out summarily. And that would, that would deteriorate the, the uh, what do you want to call it, the fighting force ability of that unit, no? Yes, uh, that's the theory, and, and p people don't really question that. Everybody, I think, who has paid any attention to military justice recognizes that. It's, a, it's critical. Uh, a, uh, a, 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 uh, an armed force uh, is not simply a, a, a crowd with weapons. Uh, you know, it has to be a disciplined armed force. Without that, you, you can't be effective as a, a military force. And good order and discipline and obedience and uh, basically being squared away are key elements. The problem is when uh, there's an expansive view of what should be handled summarily by the commander, uh, you, uh, you can uh, get distortions. For example, that suppose means unfair somebody, results. Oh well, unfair results. They may be fair or they may not be fair. But the point is that our expectation is that where there are severe punishments at stake, uh, that a person is entitled to greater due process, an independent decision maker, a lawyer attorney, a lawyer counsel uh, to advise them the rules of evidence, and all those things that come with a proper criminal trial. Uh, you, you, you could uh, a murder, for example, or a rape. How can that ever be handled administratively? Uh, setting fire to the barracks. That's not a minor disciplinary matter. That's a serious matter. Arson is one of the classic offenses known to the common law. It's a felony. So uh, things like that, uh, you know, obviously, uh, in my view, uh, should be removed from the, the commander's discretion. So one of, one of the uh, issues that, you know, that, and you talk about it, um, is the notion of confidence in the administration of justice. Yes. And that certainly applies in the larger realm of civil law, civilian law, um, and, well, and I guess in criminal law in the civilian side of things. But in the military, in a volunteer force, which is not necessarily connected so much as a, in a conscripted force was connected with friends, family, you know, all that, where they would talk to people outside, outside the military box more. Um, how important uh, is it that we have confidence in the administration of justice um, now that we have a volunteer force where the public doesn't really know what's going on anyway? Well, I think it's at least as important in an all-volunteer force environment to have public confidence in the administration of justice. Why is that? You, you might think the, uh, the exact opposite. The reason it's at least as important, and I would say more important, is because it relies on people to volunteer. It relies on families being willing to say, it's good that my son or daughter wants to go into the military. It relies on people who are already in the military in staying in the military. And if people and families and people of uh, you know, service age in that age bracket that we look to for uh, new recruits, 
don't have confidence in the administration of justice, they're going to vote with their feet. They're either not going to sign up, or when the opportunity presents itself, they will leave rather than re-enlist if they have a funny feeling that maybe the system of justice uh, cannot be relied on with that conviction, no pun intended, but that conviction that we really need to have as uh, participants in a democratic society. And, and I suppose that if we ever needed to return to a conscription, I'm not sure that will ever happen or could ever it happen. Might. But it might happen. Then you want people in the civilian community not to be intimidated by notions of unfairness in the service. You want them to have that confidence that when they go in uh, and be subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, they won't get beat up too bad. Well, I think that's right. And interestingly, the history is the UCMJ was passed after World War II when 10 or 20 million Americans were in uniform. There were a lot of uh, unfair trials. Members of Congress were elected after they came back from World War II uh, who were veterans, and they came en masse to Congress feeling that this is a system that needed to be reformed. That's, that explains why the UCMJ was passed in the first place in 1950. It was because of uh, concern about the administration of justice in World War II. A concern, by the way, that was felt by other democratic countries. Mm -hmm. One last question, Gene. I, I wish we had more time. There's really so much more that flows out of this conversation. But you know, going forward, you've been you know, in the conversation about the reform of military justice since the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and you've done a lot, spoken a lot, written a lot about all of that. But where we stand now, have your expectations for reform been met? Um, and if not, what, what do you think is, and you mentioned this in part before, what do you think are the most important initiatives that we need to be concerned about to reform ourselves so that we have mm, a, more, a more equitable system a system that conforms with the best human standards. Well, that's a tall order. I think uh, the bill that Senator Gillibrand, or something like it, really does need to be passed. Uh, the uh, military has got to get away from the notion that the military justice system is owned and operated by commanders. I didn't invent that phrase, by the way. That's from the Army's Handbook for Commanders. The notion that a system of justice that would prosecute things like murder, arson, rape, sexual assault, and so on and so forth, uh, you know, familiar serious crimes would be owned and operated by anyone other than a judge, and a judge with, uh, you know, all the trappings of office uh, is uh, intolerable in the 21st century. So that's, that's a major point. Uh, what I, I think, having lost uh, any real basis for optimism in terms of the federal courts, unless the Supreme Court changes dramatically in the next few years. Uh, I think we really have to look to Congress for reform here. The good old days of the Warren Court, and you know, people would bring lawsuits, and it would be the sweetness and light, and you'd get the result that you hoped for. Those days are largely over. Not always, but largely over. So the answer is that we need a Congress that is knowledgeable, and smart about this, one that is not going to be gullible, one that is going to conduct meaningful hearings, one that is going to ask tough questions, and one that is going to be willing to take the system into the 21st century. So far, the jury is out on that. I hope that uh, there'll be grounds for optimism, particularly with the new House of Representatives. We'll see what happens uh, at the next uh, elections in 2020 when uh, the Senate may, uh, you know, see some changes and uh, when perhaps there'll be a change in the White House. Well, looking forward to that. Gene Fidel, my brother. Thank you so much, Gene. A pleasure. Aloha.